Okay, I think we're going to get started here and people can just continue to join us as they get the time. Uh, thank you all for taking your lunch hour today to join us um, to hear about EDC's decades long work to preserve Naples. Um, we will be hearing today from Brian Troutwine, who is EDC's Senior Analyst and Watershed Program Director, and Rachel Condor, who is our staff attorney working on this right now. Um, just to give a couple little housekeeping things before we get started, I wanna point out this is being recorded um, and will be shared later for people if you wanna rewatch it or pass it on to people who weren't able to join us today. Um, we'll talk for about 30 minutes and then we'll have an opportunity for Q&A at the end. Um, at the bottom of your screen, you'll see the little Q&A icon. Feel free to put in questions there whenever they come up during the talk, and we'll do our best to get through them all at the end. Uh, and if we don't answer your question, we can certainly try and to address it afterwards um, by email. And um, with that, I am going to turn this over to Brian, and we will dive in. Thank you so much. Thank you, Betsy, and good afternoon, everybody. I'm Brian Troutwine with the Environmental Defense Center. EDC is a nonprofit public interest environmental law firm dedicated to protecting and restoring the central coast environment through education, advocacy, and legal action. EDC has represented over 130 nonprofits since 1977. EDC represents our members and the Santa Barbara chapter of the Surfrider Foundation in efforts to preserve the remarkable Naples landscape and its natural, cultural, scenic, and recreational values. This is the mouth of Dos Pueblos Creek, which flows out of a canyon the Chumash call Anak Pu after Bobcat. The creek forms a border between two Chumash villages, Miku on the left and Kuyamu on the right, which form the basis for the area's European name, Dos Pueblos, or two villages. Miku and Kuyamu and this entire region are unceded Chumash lands stolen from them by European colonizers who nearly wiped out the entire Chumash culture. But the Chumash remain a dignified society rich with culture. At the time of colonization, the Chumash in this region, including the Barbarino Band of Chumash Indians and the Coastal Band of the Chumash Nation, were among the most advanced societies in America. Large, dense populations were sustained by abundant food sources. We can learn a tremendous amount from the Chumash. The Chumash live in harmony with nature. The Chumash sustain the environment and continue to be great stewards. European colonization and greed threaten Naples. There's a long history at Miku and Kuyamu prior to the arrival of the Europeans. The two villages had two different Chumash languages and different cultures and coexisted on opposite sides of the creek. The villagers weren't even allowed to cross the creek without first getting the other tribe's permission. Chumash lived in homes called ops that housed up to 50 people. They slept in raised frame beds or used sand inside their ops to make their floors soft and slept underneath skins and rabbit fur blankets. The Spanish Padres forced them to live in the missions, and the first people they took were the Chumash children. The soldados or soldiers enslaved Chumash people, forced them to work in the presidios, subjected them to disease, and even killed them. Many Chumash people rebelled and left the area, some going as far away as Tulare County. This information was gleaned from GolitaHistory.com and directly from the Chumash community, but if you want to learn more, please check out wishtoyo.org. Naples covers parts of Santa Barbara Ranch, pictured here, and Dos Pueblos Ranch, which was recently purchased by a new owner. The Union Pacific Railroad, lined by eucalyptus trees, traverses the coastal plain from left to right. Above that is Highway 101 from the Dos Pueblos Creek Bridge on the left to Tomate Canyon on the right. Above the 101 is Dos Pueblos Reservoir. To its right is the one spec house built after the county approved the 71 unit Santa Barbara Ranch project in 2008, prompting EDC's lawsuit on behalf of the Surfrider Foundation and EDC's members 
and joined by our co-plaintiff, uh, co the Naples Coalition. The developer lived in this house before bankruptcy through the property into bank ownership. And EDC's outstanding staff attorney, Rachel Condor, will talk more about our legal work, which with your ongoing support, continues to stall development, creating a path for potential preservation. Nicholas Den fell in love with the Naples area and purchased it in 1837. A wealthy world traveler named John H. Williams and his wife Alice purchased the Naples area from the Den family in 1887 for $50,000. The Williams planned a hotel and a community called Naples by the Sea since it reminded them of Naples, Italy. That began the Naples Improvement Company. They launched a nationwide advertising campaign and described the town and hotel as if they already existed, which of course they didn't. They described boating on the Naples Bay and they described the Dos Pueblos River and a harbor, uh, which was really just a duck pond. Originally, there were over 400 parcels in the Naples town site. After two trips to the California Supreme Court in the 1980s, which Rachel will summarize, the official map today reflects 274 lots, so there's still a threat of development. The yellow polygons in this image show Dos Pueblos Ranch North's avocado orchards. Dos Pueblos Ranch North was purchased by Simple Avo several years ago. To effectuate the development of the 71 homes approved by the county in 2008, an agricultural easement would be required. However, Simple Avo has no interest in facilitating the development by allowing their land to be used for the easement. So it's fortuitous that Simple Avo purchased Dos Pueblos Ranch back uh, several years ago. The purple polygons represent the current orchards on Dos Pueblos Ranch South. The new owner of Dos Pueblos Ranch South plans sustainable agriculture, including on-site composting and agricultural research. They also envision a beach access trail, a scientific research hub, and events for nonprofits, as well as private events to fund the Dos Pueblos Institute. Events would occur at Dos Pueblos Beach near the red polygons, which are the abalone and kelp farms you may have heard about. The abalone farm sells only on the West Coast. It's also involved in efforts to restore the dwindling abalone populations, some of which are endangered. The Black Polygon was once a large orchard on Santa Barbara Ranch that succumbed to root rot, and it's where many of the 71 estates were approved back in 2008. The Pink Polygons are the grazing areas, and the Blue Polygons are reservoirs serving agriculture. And I might point out there's two additional reservoirs further up the creek not shown on this image. EDC actually filed a complaint because the uh, agricultural operation diverts water from the creek to serve the orchards and that harms the wildlife in the creek and the California Fish and Wildlife issued a violation in response to EDC's complaint. Santa Barbara Ranch south of 101 has been used by the public for decades and a trail exists across the coastal bluff down to the ocean. The area is seeing more and more public access, especially on days when there are good waves and we urge you to get out there and check out Naples. It's beautiful this time of year. Naples supports diverse, uh, diverse native plant communities. The homes shown here are from a prior iteration of the project, which was changed in 2008 when the project was approved. The approved project shifted homes farther to the north, more out of the Highway 101 view shed, but further into natural areas, including oak woodlands. And Rachel will show the approved project's layout. The dark lavender area in the lower left portion of this image uh, down in this area here is the oak woodland along a tributary to Dos Pueblos Creek. And Dos Pueblos Creek's majestic sycamore woodland is along the far left side of this image. Both are environmentally sensitive habitats or eshes. The light brown area up here by the reservoir and on the far right hand side of the image is coastal sage, another type of esha. The coastal sage in the lower right hand corner here actually has a flowing spring and is located along Tomate Canyon Creek. The green patch located under Highway 101 here is a native grassland and that's significant because it's another type of esha and we've lost 99.9% .9 of native grasslands in California. So it's extremely rare. 
Then the vast light purple areas are non-native grasslands dominated by species such as mustard. And the yellow areas are non-native grasslands dominated by exotic grasses. While non-native, these grasslands are nonetheless critical for many rare species, including badgers, mountain lions, white-tailed kites, and other raptors. The 16 mini mansions approved in 2008 in the southern half of Santa Barbara Ranch, shown here, um, but have not been built, of course, would be as large as 10,000 square feet. Note the native grasslands in green along the ravines, along the coastal bluff, and also note on the right-hand side of the image, the yellow uh, trail, which was approved along with a parking lot, restrooms, showers, and a beach access staircase in the lower right-hand corner, but again, have not been built. Several important wetlands also dot the coastal bluff here. County policies re require protection of sensitive habitats or ESHAs and wetlands and the land around them. So if the project is ever built, it would destroy sensitive habitats, despoil the coast, and establish a terrible precedent for the development of Gaviota. Naples would be the first domino, but with your support, we will not let it fall. In 2019, the owners of Santa Barbara Ranch, shown in magenta, and lot 66 and 69, shown in the yellow hash marks, dissed most of the coastal bluff, damaging grasslands, wetlands, and bird and wildlife habitat. Disking turned the soil over, eliminated native plants, allowed weeds to prosper, and made hunting very difficult for birds of prey. The green areas here again are the native grasslands, the blue areas are the wetlands. So the county issued violations to the owners for this damage to the habitats. And the owners are required to restore the native grasslands and wetlands, but the county grossly underestimated the damage. And the habitat restoration plans are exceptionally weak. For instance, the wetlands plan calls for creating an artificial wetland fed by polluted stormwater runoff from the approved homes if, if they're ever built and has no requirement to actually plant native plants. The grassland restoration plan is merely a landscaping plan with two native grasses, but none of the 13 associated native wildflowers such as lupin, blue-eyed grass, and alclover. EDC, Surfrider, and the Gaviota Coast Conservancy, or GCC, critique these plans. While the plans have been improved slightly as a result, the plans still fall far short of what's needed to restore the damaged habitats. EDC, Surfrider, and GCC appealed the county's approval of the habitat restoration plans. And with your support, we will ensure full restoration of those habitats. Dos Pueblos Creek flows through a canyon the Chumash again referred to as Anakku. It begins as two forks near Broadcast Peak on West Camino Cielo and flows through the National Forest. A horizontal well was drilled into the mountain and discharges water into the creek. And this may be why the creek generally flows year round. Because of this, the creek boasts a lush riparian woodland with towering sycamore, alder, and cottonwood trees. Uh, the creek provides excellent habitat for rare species, and it's one of the last streams to support southern steelhead, which I was lucky enough to see in Dos Pueblos Creek several years ago. Steelhead can live as rainbow trout in the creeks their whole lives or migrate to the ocean and become salmon. It's unclear whether they persist in the creek today given climate change. After all, this is the driest period in 1200 years. The developer was required to restore the creek as part of an agreement with the county, but failed to do so. Thanks to your support, EDC, Surfrider, and GCC recently appealed the county staff's finding that the developer complied with that agreement. And Rachel will discuss this further in a few minutes. Dos Pueblos Creek supports rare species, including the federally endangered southern steelhead, one of the rarest fish in America, the California red-legged frog, a federally threatened species, and the two-striped garter snake, a state species of concern. EDC is working to preserve these species, but they're threatened by the diversion of water from the creek. Impediments block steelhead migration. For example, there's a four-foot concrete dam under Highway 101 located in the creek. Ag runoff, including pesticides and fertilizers, is another threat. And climate change is drying the creek and increasing fires. And while these species are adapted to periodic fires, more frequent and more severe fires increase the threats, including debris flows. 
this is the uh, California newt, a state species of concern. And this, I took this video in a creek near Naples. This is one of the most toxic species on the, in the world, uh, toxic animal species in the world. And then this is the Western pond turtle. The Western pond turtle can hold its breath for over 20 minutes and lives up to 45 years. It's being considered for endangered species listing. And they only have a few remaining breeding pools. And I took this video at one of those pools up in the National Forest. And this is another species that occurs at Naples. This is the mountain king snake. I took this video up at Jesusita Trail, but they occur at Naples as well. California Fish and Wildlife established the Naples Marine Conservation Area in 2012 due to the area's spectacular natural resources, including the seal haul out on the beach. A kelp forest, surf grass, and the rocky Naples Reef contribute to tremendous fish resources and, and biodiversity where warm southern and cold northern currents mix. It's illegal to injure, damage, or possess living geologic or cultural resources in this area, except spearfishing for white sea bass and pelagic fish and commercial kelp harvesting, which is allowed. Sea otters are seen here sometimes. Until 2012, the unsuccessful no otter policy required translocating otters that venture south of Point Conception out to Santa Barbara Island, where sadly most of them perished, were killed, or tried to swim back. But thanks to your support, EDC forced the US Fish and Wildlife Service to drop this inhumane policy. Naples is home to as many as 43 rare bird species, including the Northern Harrier. The white-tailed kite, a fully protected species, is shown here kiting, which means it's hovering by beating its wings and searching for prey such as voles in the grasslands. The burrowing owl is another state species of concern which overwinters in ground squirrel burrows in coastal areas, including at Naples. And the sharp shinned hawk is a state species of concern which hunts songbirds in the oak woodlands and riparian areas at Naples. The short-eared owl is another state species of concern which hunts in the grasslands. And the osprey is a state species of concern which hunts the coastal waters off Naples. EDC staff was treated to this osprey sighting last month out at Naples. And you can see how majestic the osprey is as it hunts for fish over the coastal waters. Naples has high biodiversity in part because together we've kept it undeveloped uh, and because of the diverse habitat types. Up to 14 rare mammals live at Naples. The San Diego black-tailed jackrabbit and dusky-footed wood rat are species of concern in California. Mountain lions in the Central Coast were listed as threatened under the California Endangered Species Act last year. Ringtails are fully protected species which live along creeks, including Dos Pueblos Creek and Rocky Chaparral areas. They're one of the least known and least frequently seen mammals in our region. If you've seen one, you're very lucky. There are also up to eight rare bat species which may occur at Naples, including the Townsend's bigger bat uh, shown here, a uh, very cute bat species that occurs at Naples. And the American badger is yet another state species of concern. Naples is home to as many as 41 rare plant species, including the endangered gaviota tar plant shown here. So Naples has incredibly high biodiversity, many rare plants and wildlife species, incredible landscapes, sensitive and treasured cultural resources, and important passive recreational opportunities. That's why with your critical support, EDC is fighting so hard to protect Naples for you, for your children, your grandchildren, friends, and for our future generations. Now EDC staff attorney, Rachel Condor, We'll discuss EDC's decades of effective legal work to preserve Naples. Take it away, Rachel. <laughs> Thank you so much, Brian. I will just um, share my screen here. Get my. Okay. Well, thank you all so much for joining us today. Um, I'm really excited to see how many people are here um, 
to talk about Naples or learn about Naples if they haven't heard about it before. So as Brian mentioned, uh, ADC has worked many years to fend off development proposals um, for Naples and ultimately to achieve our goals of permanent preservation for the area. EDC currently re represents our members and the Santa Barbara chapter of the Surfrider Foundation in these efforts. In the past, EDC has used many tools to preserve Naples, and currently we're working on several different campaigns related to the property, each of which I'll mention in more detail later on, but I'll just give you a brief preview here. The first is opposing development uh, that was approved by the county in 2008 on Santa Barbara Ranch. Another is opposing pending permit applications for development of two specific lots, lots 66 and 69 within that approved project. And next, we are seeking restoration to address illegal disking, which Brian mentioned. And then lastly, we are always looking to pursue or support opportunities for permanent preservation of parcels within Naples, especially those that provide public access and resource protection. And we also look for those types of opportunities on the Gaviota Coast generally. But before getting into the specific efforts we have underway today, I'd like to give you some of the legal history of Naples, which Brian has touched on, and, and then talk about how, when, and why this became a legal case for EDC. And then I'll talk about a specific current effort that we'd love to get your help with. So I think to understand the situation at Naples, we have to reach back in time a bit. Um, Brian mentioned the original town site map from 1888 that the Naples Improvement Company filed. Um, this was for 400 lots on approximately 800 acres as seen here on this slide. Importantly, this map was filed before California passed the state's first subdivision map act in 1893. And that law governs the subdivision of land in the state and requires that, the gov that a governing body like a city or a county approve almost um, every subdivision of land. So it can't be done willy nilly. And the filing of the town site map, in this case, prior to that, um, that passage of the, the first map act, subdivision map act um, in 1893, that would have major ramifications for Naples later on in the 20th century and beyond. In 1929, the county completed the official map for Naples with the 400 lots designated. However, in the early 80s, in a totally different era, the county adopted a local coastal program that imposed an agricultural land use and zoning designation for Naples with a minimum lot size of 100 acres, which is much larger than the lot size for the original 400 lots, which um, had actually discouraged development. Um, the county, a, a few years later, adopted overlay zoning that required that pre-1983 subdivisions regarding so-called antiquated subdivisions be merged to meet the zoning minimum lot size, in this case, 100 acres. Now, the owners of a major portion of the town site of Naples at the time, the Moorharts, were not happy with the county zoning decision and the local, local coastal plan, and they sued the county, challenging the county's denial of their coastal development permit. The case went to the California Supreme Court, which ruled in Moorhart versus County of Santa Barbara that the county could not force the merger of lots under the Subdivision Map Act. So the county, in order to determine how many of the lots were legally created based on prior conveyances, then completed title searches for the 400 lots and found that only 274 of them were legal parcels. So then in a second lawsuit, the same landowners, the Moorharts who had sued the county sued again, but before a final decision came down from the court, the property was sold to an owner who reached an agreement with the county to process a plan for fewer larger lots and homes. And in truth, we believe that no one really wanted to build on those small original lots anyway, so this was suitable for the developers' plans for larger estates. Um, EDC wasn't involved in the cases um, that went before the Supreme Court. Our litigation came about later, which I'll talk about in a little bit. 
So following the Supreme Court rulings, which shot down the county's efforts to preserve the parcels in Naples as large ag lots in the mid 2000s, the county went through a process to approve development at Naples. And in 2008, after many contentious, contentious hearings and public protests, the county narrowly approved development for up to 71 mega mansions. 21 of those would, would be south of 101 and 50 north of 101. But because the development would impact sensitive habitats, views, and water, EDC filed suit on behalf of the Surfrider Foundation with the Naples Coalition joining our lawsuit. In our lawsuit, um, which is, the case name is Naples Coalition versus County of Santa Barbara, we claimed that the approval of the environmental impact report violated the California Environmental Quality Act, the California Coastal Act, as well as county land use and zoning codes. Unfortunately, we did not prevail in our lawsuit on the claims involving the inland portion of the development. We faced an uphill battle due to the deference courts give to agency decision makers under the substantial evidence rule, among other reasons. Um, and the county's approvals for the coastal portion, which generally that's between 101 and the ocean, um, those are still in limbo today because the county submittals to the Coastal Commission were deemed incomplete and the county did not respond to the agency with more information, so they closed the file. And the developer would have to conduct new surveys before the Coastal Commission would reconsider the plan for those coastal lots. Although we didn't prevail on some of our claims, our fight against the development approval continues to this day, which is what I'll talk about next. So this brings me to an ongoing fight we are waging now over potential development at Santa Barbara Ranch. Going back to that um, 2008 approval by the County of Santa Barbara that we challenged, that plan would have allowed up to 50 mega mansions on the inland portion of Santa Barbara Ranch. And as part of that approval, the county entered into what's called the Inland Development Agreement. So I'm gonna get a little wonky here. And um, if I haven't been so already, just bear with me. Um, the Inland Development Agreement, um, this is from 2008, approved by the county, gives the, it gives the developer 20 years to build under, under 2008 zoning and land use rules. In other words, freezing the effect of any new or more progressive land use rules and zoning. And this is incredibly valuable to a developer to be able to freeze the rules for this long of a period. Because as we all know, things tend to get more restrictive and, um, uh, and, and as we lose open space and agricultural lands over time, um, we, we get more protective of our zoning and land use. So um, the, to have, to have the, the dates um, harken back to that older time period is really valuable for a developer when they do their um, development plans. So in exchange for these extended development rights, the developer was required to do several things pay $100,000 to a nonprofit to create a restoration plan for DP Creek, Dos Pueblos Creek, and then pay $300,000 to implement that creek restoration within five years. This work was all to, to be completed by a professional nonprofit, but the developer was required to offer all reasonable assistance to make sure that a creek restoration project was carried out. The agreement also allowed that if restoration could not be completed within a certain number of years, there was additional time to complete a project elsewhere on the Gaviota Coast. And the deadline for that alternative site was April 8, 2021, last year. While we don't believe that the public really got a good deal in the bargain with the developer of Santa Barbara Ranch back in 2008. I wanna highlight here that restoration is badly needed on Dos Pueblos Creek and on creeks on the Gaviota Coast generally. For example, on Dos Pueblos Creek, there are numerous concrete channels and other man-made structures that serve as impediments to fish passage, along with much non-native vegetation that needs to be removed. And if anyone has any questions about that, Brian is an expert on that, on the what needs to be done um, to restore that creek. Um, here are some photos from the restoration plan for Dos Pueblos Creek that came out of the development agreement that show how it's been degraded. If implemented, this plan 
would help to restore the riparian corridor and ecosystem of the creek so that it could better function as habitat for steelhead and many other species that Brian talked about and improve the water quality of the creek as it flows into the ocean. I will note though that this restoration plan would cost many millions of dollars if ever completed and there was no expectation that the $300,000 in restoration required under the development agreement would accomplish that daunting task. Um, however, the development agreement did require that funds be used to implement the plan on Dos Pueblos Creek. And to date, there has been no actual on the ground restoration work completed on the creek or another creek on the Gaviota pursuant to the development agreement. So when it became clear to us in April of last year, on April 8th, 2021, that the developer would not meet the deadline for completion of restoration work. And with the money designated for that purpose almost gone, that $300,000 was almost gone, we appealed the County Planning Department's determination that the developer was in compliance with that agreement. So at a hearing late last year before the Board of Supervisors, we, along with the Gaviota Coast Conservancy, represented by the Law Office of Mark Chatillo, presented our appeal. The Board, after a lengthy discussion, voted 3-2 to find the developer in violation of the agreement and directed staff to prepare findings to support that. And so we are now waiting for a final, or sorry, for a follow-up hearing uh, in May for the board to explain what the developer needs to do to preserve his development rights. And at that time, we will argue that the development agreement should be terminated if the developer does not come forward with a plan for meaningful creek restoration on the Gaviota. So here's where you come in. Um, we would love to have your support for our appeal that will be heard again on May 17th before the county board. And our message at that hearing will be that the public must get meaningful creek restoration or the development agreement must be terminated. So shifting focus for just a few seconds here, I wanna quickly mention one of our other efforts, um, which is trying to hold the county and developers feet to the fire regarding illegal disking work on the Santa Barbara Ranch and DMF Ma properties, which Brian talked about earlier. In addition, the owners of lot 66 and 69 in the yellow hatching here, um, where that illegal work occurred, has applied for development permits for two large estates. And we are going to be closely watching this process and we will stay involved to fight any development pros proposals on those lots. So otherwise, if you'd like to stay informed about Naples and other EDC campaigns, please sign up for our mailing list on our webpage or by emailing edc at environmentaldefensecenter.org. Thank you so much for hanging in there with me. I realized that was a bit dense with the legal and historical information. So please feel free to ask any questions you might have to help clarify anything from my talk or from Brian's. And I will now turn it back to Betsy for questions. Thank you so much, Brian and Rachel, for that amazing tour of Naples. Um, as Brian mentioned, EDC staff took a afternoon a week or two ago to get out there, and it was absolutely beautiful. It's just so green and pretty right now. I really recommend you all take, an, take a chance to get out there. Um, so I'm going to dive into a few questions that have come in, and um, feel free, if you have not already, to type them in using the little Q&A icon at the bottom and we'll do our best to get through some of them. Um, the first one here is, did the project approved in 2008 include a section of the coastal trail? I think maybe Brian, if you wanna take a stab at that one. Thank you, Betsy. And that's a great question um, because it was a controversial issue back in 2008 when the county approved the Santa Barbara Ranch project with the uh, 71 homes, it, it approved a trail that went out to the beach, a beach staircase on the bluff and parking, restrooms and uh, showers, which were never built. And it did not include a section of the coastal trail, 
which is different from the beach access trail that was included in the project. The coastal trail is a state priority to have a trail all up and down the California coast. This trail, uh, this project rather, did not have a section of the coastal trail going along the bluff. It only had a trail out to the beach and back. So that was a point of controversy. People um, weren't happy about the fact that the project didn't include a section of the coastal trail. It may be the only opportunity to get a coastal trail at Naples. And so it was a significant omission from the project. And I think that answers the question, um, but if there's a follow-up, I'm happy to address that as well. Thank you. Um, this is just kind of a fun one, but I, I greatly appreciate this. Uh, we have someone commenting on um, the one downfall about this webinar format is people aren't able to see how many other supporters and people interested are joining today. Um, so just to let you know, we have about 75 people on today joining us. So um, slightly fewer than had registered, but all in all a great turnout. So um, thank you for that question. And uh, moving on, <laughs> another kind of fun one is people are curious on how, how to get to Naples if they wanna go visit. that um, quickly and we do encourage you to get out there as Betsy said it is spectacular this time of year the grass is green um, the trails are nice it's easy to get down to the beach so take a 101 north to Dos Pueblos Canyon Road uh, get off at Dos Pueblos Canyon Road and follow it as it turns left under highway 101 it comes to a stop sign on the ocean side of the 101 turn left at the stop sign and continue along that road until just before the Highway 101 southbound on-ramp. And you'll see other cars parked there. Um, so you park there right before the 101 southbound on-ramp and then you look for a trail just on the left side of the gate and follow that trail. It starts off as a road, um, but you follow that. It crosses the railroad tracks and takes you down to the coastal bluff and the ocean. Great. Uh, we have a couple questions about the creek restoration. Um, maybe Rachel and Brian can tag team these. Uh, people are wondering if the developer made any progress toward the requirements um, and also what exactly we would like to see done to the creek in order to restore it. Okay, so maybe I'll start and then Brian can talk about the aspects of the actual on the ground restoration. So the um, developer had five years, a five year period to after, this is after the plan for restoration was created, that did happen. And then after that, had, the developer had five years through the, with the help of a nonprofit that they were supposed to contract with to, to do a Creek restoration project on Dos Pueblos Creek. So the deadline for that, ran in April of 2019. And um, that never happened. There was never any on the ground restoration of Dos Pueblos Creek, largely, I believe, because the landowners um, affected or the landowners who own the land where the creek runs through were not um, amenable to an agreement with Santa Barbara Ranch for complicated reasons. So they um, declined to participate. And so then the, the agreement with the county did provide an alternative um, provision so that if that, if that in happened, that there would be some ability uh, for the developer to still meet the terms of the agreement um, by completing a creek restoration project on an alternative site along the Gaviota Coast. And so the developer, as I said during my talk, was required to offer this reasonable assistance, even though they were doing supposed to do the project through a nonprofit. Um, but what it looks like, they had an additional two years to do an alternative site. And what it looks like from the record is that um, while the developer seemed to have been pursuing a creek restoration on Dos Pueblos Creek, once that became um, untenable, the developer doesn't seem to have offered any assistance as far as trying to get an alternative site done on the Gaviota Coast. And so that additional two years, nothing seems, there wasn't much done in terms of trying to pursue a, a creek restoration. So 
a, that's a long way of saying that there were seven years to do some type of creek restoration on the Gaviota or on Dos Pueblos Creek, and that never happened. So then I'll, I'll just turn it over to Brian to talk about the technical parts. Thanks, Rachel. Yeah, the creek, Dos Pueblos Creek, is one of, uh, one of the gems of the South Coast. It, it flows year-round. It has all those rare species I talked about, and yet it's, it's degraded. Um, it's been concrete channelized south of 101, and there are a lot of non-native plants that are <laughs> flourishing along it that um, displace native habitat. The creek also is, as I mentioned, diverted. Um, so water is taken out of the creek for agriculture, leaving less water for wildlife and fish. And there's also um, the, the whole estuary was at some point dammed off. And so when it used to have a large lagoon at the mouth of the creek, it's now just a, a ponded, a dammed, uh, a dammed pond, if you will. It, it doesn't have a connection to the ocean. Um, for the estuary. So there's a lot that needs to be done that the pond estuary should be breached so that there's again an, a functioning estuary. The concrete channels need to be removed. There are numerous impediments to steelhead migration that should be removed to allow that incredibly rare fish to migrate back up from the ocean and spawn. And there needs to be control of erosion and agricultural runoff to protect water quality in the creek. So Great Creek, uh, there's a lot to be done. And as Rachel said, it wasn't done as required um, by the developer. Thank you both. Um, switching from creek restoration over to uh, restoration of from the illegal disking, there's a couple questions um, regarding if the develop if the developer has completed any remediation from that, and also if there's anything that our supporters who are joining us today can do um, moving forward to to help ensure that restoration happens. Well, I can take the first part of that in terms of whether anything's been done to restore the habitats that were damaged by the illegal disking that occurred three years ago. And perhaps Rachel may want to weigh in in addition on um, the process going forward. But know that uh, the landowners have not done anything to restore the damage from the illegal disking. Uh, the disking damaged the wetlands. It damaged the extensive and rare native grasslands on the coastal bluff. And uh, the county did issue a violation and required restoration, but the restoration plans just are not up to snuff. Um, and so the county's been going through different versions of those plans, trying to um, you know, get the plans to be a little bit better, um, but they're still really weak. And ultimately, you know, we, we need that restoration to happen sooner rather than later because as time goes on, the impacts to habitat just perpetuate themselves. So nothing's happened yet, um, but we did appeal the county's approval of the restoration plans. Um, and so that uh, will be coming up for a hearing at some point in the future. I, th I think Brian pretty well co pretty, covered it pretty well. Um, I don't know if Brian will be willing to share this, but we'll see. Um, we have someone asking, where in Dos Pueblos Creek did you see the steelhead? <laughs> um, great question. Uh, I would say a secret location, but there's only one location on the creek that's visible from a public road, and that's underneath the Highway 101 bridge where that four-foot dam is located. And I saw about a 16-inch steelhead swimming downstream towards the ocean uh, just uh, there under 101 along Dos Pueblos. Canyon Road. So you can um, park, I don't know if you can park there, but you can certainly see the creek from that location. And that's where I happen to see a steelhead, um, one of very, a very rare uh, sighting indeed. And I'm conscious of everyone's time. And I, we said we're going to end at 1245. But one final thing, since we're pushing everyone to get out there, I wanted to address this. Uh, we have some people asking about access rights for the public right now and the history of people being um, reporting being harassed out there by land managers. And so if, if you could maybe just touch on um, public access right now, that would be great. Sure, um, I will attempt to address that. So EDC uh, did do a site visit out there last month. Um, we saw a tremendous wildlife and the osprey and it is open for public access. The public's been using it for decades. And um, 
had, and there's an established public trail that goes down there. I understand in, in the past there has been some um, guards at the parking area, you know, suggesting that the public doesn't have a right to go there. Uh, but again, it's been used um, by the public for decades. EDC went out there and, and um, it's absolutely open for the public to go out there and enjoy the, uh, the Naples Bluff there via at Santa Barbara Ranch. Great. And, and I'll reiterate, uh, just at Santa Barbara Ranch, south of 101. Perfect. Well, thank you all. There are definitely some more questions here that are great that we didn't get a chance to answer. So we have those and we'll get back to you all with some, some answers on those. If more come up, please feel free to uh, reach out to Rachel or Brian or myself. And um, we really appreciate you taking your lunch hour to join us. So thank you very much.